Let's talk about a very special Le Mans project today. Some say it was the biggest failure at Le Mans of all time, some say it was a genius design. The 2015 Nissan GTR LM Nismo. In 2014, the new LMP1 regulations were introduced. In terms of engine design, everything was allowed. Number of cylinders, engine size, turbocharged or not, diesel or petrol, you could do whatever you want. The regulations also introduced four hybrid classes, which defined how much energy a hybrid system could deliver during one Le Mans lap. 2, 4, 6 or 8 MJ. The more hybrid power you chose, the less fuel flow your combustion engine could have. So for manufacturers, it was a huge playground to showcase their technical competency. Porsche joined in 2014 with a turbocharged 2.0-liter V4 engine and a 6 MJ hybrid system with battery. Audi started with their 4.0-liter 120-degree V6 diesel and an electric flywheel in the 2 MJ class. And Toyota kept their naturally aspirated V8 and homologated the car in the 6 MJ class with capacitors as energy storage. So in that time, Nissan decided to compete in the LMP1 class from 2015 onwards. The Nissan Motorsport division, Nismo, announced their program on 23rd of May 2014. They will compete in the 2015 season with two cars and three cars in Le Mans. Technical director was Ben Bolby, who was already responsible for the unusual Nissan Delta Wing project. A car with super efficient aerodynamics and 75% of its weight at the rear. So now the engineers sat down and brainstormed what would be the best concept to compete in Le Mans. They realized that every competitor was using mid-engine prototypes with rear-wheel drive. So cars with a slightly rear-biased weight distribution. To not change the handling with speed, the aero balance was also slightly rear biased. And as a result, the regulators were quite restrictive for aero elements at the back to avoid competitors from getting too fast. The innovative and brave team around Bolby now realized that actually there are not many restrictions for front downforce. But if you create a car with lots of downforce at the front, you also want to match the weight distribution to that. Again, to keep the same handling with speed. Otherwise, you would have an understeering car at low speeds and an oversteering car at high speeds. So they decided to move the engine to the front to match the aero and weight balance. Because of that, they also matched the tire sizes to that. If there is a lot more weight on the front axle, you need wider tires there to keep the contact patch pressure the same. And vice versa. If there is little weight on the rear axle, you can have thinner tires there. Since Le Mans is a very special track with long straights and quick directional changes and then long straights again, Nissan found that thinner rear tires would give them a good drag reduction, which would be a great advantage for Le Mans. Since powering a light rear axle with thinner tires doesn't really make sense, Nissan decided to design the car with front rear drive, because they have weight and downforce on the front axle already. Also, if they now connect some kind of hybrid system to the drivetrain, they would be able to recover a lot more energy from this one axle than others could do with their mid-engine cars. So let's look at some numbers. If we take the minimum weight of 870 kg and we assume a weight distribution for a mid-engine car of 45% front and compare that with the front-engine Nissan with 65% front, we can see that under braking, weight shifts forward, let's say 20%, and the Nissan has around 30% more weight on the front axle under braking. So there is a lot of kinetic energy to recover. And the good thing is that this energy only needs to be recovered from one axle and not two like the competition, which makes the system a lot simpler. So on 18th of November 2014, the experienced German Nissan works driver Michael Krumm did the first test drive with the car. And a picture appeared online that shocked the motorsport world. People ask, what is that? All tech in front, massive front wheels and literally nothing at the rear. The car had 65% of its weight at the front. So Nissan took a monocoque, connected a Cosworth based 60 degree 3 liter V6 turbo engine in front and in front of that the gearbox. So the drivetrain is exactly the other way around like a, on a conventional car. And with 440 kg, the drivetrain is around half the weight of the car. 
In general, because of the unusual design, no component was simply off the shelf like on other cars, which added to the time issue. All of the cooling sits in front as well and uses the higher pressure at the front and vents hot air out at the top. The engine uses water-to-air intercoolers and has very short exhausts which exit at the top for nice flames in front of the driver at night. Because of the tight package, they used a pull rod suspension for the front axle, but with the coilovers laying on top of the gearbox. The gearbox itself was also housing the alternator and only had five gears to keep it shorter and to reduce front overhang. Underneath the front axle was a huge front diffuser which vented air into large channels either side, large enough for babies to crawl inside, as the chief engineer tried himself. So the Nissan was able to guide the flow through the car to the back instead of venting air outboard like the competition. That again reduced drag. Because there was literally nothing in the back anymore and the rear wheels were only 9 inch wide instead of 14 inch like the competitors, they could fill the whole wake behind the car with these channels, eliminating wake, reducing drag and increasing performance of their front diffuser. At first, they even thought about not using a rear wing. To allow for such huge channels, the rear design is very special. The large channel is part of the chassis and the rear suspension extremely short. There are tiny wishbones and there is a tiny pole rod to work with tiny coilovers. Coilovers are hydraulically connected to control roll and heave and so there is nothing in the way for a large channel. But what about the hybrid system, you might ask? Because of the huge potential at the front axle, Nissan decided to start in the 8 MJ class, so the highest class. And not just that, instead of using electrical systems like the competition, Nissan decided to use a mechanical energy recovery system. It was connected at the back of the engine, so underneath the driver's legs inside the survival cell, and it featured two parallel Toro Truck flywheels which run in a near vacuum. Toro Truck rated them at 400 kJ each, so 800 kJ for both. But Nissan demanded 1200 kJ for both. So that created the first real engineering problems. Because the supplier needed to increase the performance of the system by 50% within the same space, they needed time to develop that. Time that Nissan didn't have. Because for the start of the 2015 WEC season, they only had a couple of months. Let's take a closer look at this mechanical system. Why is a mechanical system better than an electric system? Because you save the energy conversion from rotation to electric and back during deployment. So a mechanical system is more efficient. Also, it's smaller and relatively light with only 8.5 kg per rotor. When you work on the car, there's no high voltage and it doesn't deteriorate. So it's basically like a toy car, where you use the kinetic energy of a spinning wheel. It's connected to the drivetrain with a lot of small gears and you can already guess the complexity and challenges for reliability. But that's not everything. In order to control the energy delivery of the spinning wheel to the drivetrain, you need a CVT gearbox, which also needs to be packaged and spin at up to 65,000 RPM. And for all these gears and other rotating parts, you need oil. Additionally, Nissan planned on harvesting energy at the front and deploying it at the rear. But since it's a mechanical system, you cannot just pull a cable somehow through the car, you need even more gears and shafts to deliver the power to the rear. So at the beginning, Nissan just built the car for front axle deployment to save the complexity. The ERS system on the dyno was fine, but we have to remember here that the Toro truck system was originally designed for road cars and commercial vehicles. So when they first hit the track and tried to run the system with the extreme g-forces the Nissan prototype was producing, all sorts of problems occurred. The rotors lost their near-vacuum environment, meaning the tips were spinning at supersonic speeds and were literally destroying themselves. And the scavenging oil system didn't work properly with the high g-force as well, which caused lubrication problems. An easy fix wasn't possible and time was running out. Nissan originally announced the car in the 8 MJ class with around 1400 horsepower, but the combustion engine itself only had around 550 horsepower. Meanwhile, the first picture of the car was shown during the Super Bowl on 1st of February 2015, and technical director Bolbay gave first interviews to magazines to explain the car. In the background, another issue was the crash test. 
Because it wasn't simply a monocoque with a bolted on crash box like other cars, the Nissan had the monocoque, engine, gearbox and then the crash box in front. So it was a lot more complex and Nissan failed the first two attempts. Nissan then cancelled the first races of the 2015 season and the car simply wasn't ready yet. But the Nissan management, which decided for the project quite late in 2014, now demanded that the car would race in Le Mans anyway. And that's when the disaster started. So a race team tried to somehow change the car to run without hybrid system. They now registered their prototype in the 2 megajoule class, so the lowest class, to be able to run the engine with higher fuel flow. But they had to have the not working hybrid system on board anyway to meet the minimum weight requirement. Also, they now needed larger front brakes because they didn't have a hybrid system to help with braking. That required larger front rims, so they changed from 16 inch rims to 18 inch rims and because the overall wheel diameter shouldn't be larger, the rubber side wall of their front wheels was now a lot smaller, meaning it can take less stresses, which is not ideal if your whole concept depends on front axle performance. So now the team arrived in Le Mans with three cars, without any race experience with this car before. And usually you do at least three 24 hour tests before you go to Le Mans. The first problem was the pit exit in Le Mans. It's a relatively steep exit and wheel spin here is not allowed. To keep the front overhang shorter, the Nissans had only five gears. And because of its low drag design, these five gears were pretty long. So if the Nissans now had to start here from a complete stop, only with front wheel drive, a long first gear and cold tires, it was almost impossible to start without wheel spin. So they reduced boost pressure for these situations, but then drivers were stalling the engine. And if they spin the wheels, they would get a penalty. So already the pit exit was a challenge. Another thing was that the front suspension was designed with little caster angle to keep it light and reduce the required power steering. But the front wheel drive influence in the steering was too big and they increased the caster angle again, resulting in heavy steering that caused drivers to take a hand off the wheel to rest. But when the car was driving, it wasn't all that bad. Nissan predicted that the engine was bulletproof after all their dyno runs, and it was. It didn't cause any issues, and even with only combustion engine power, the Nissan reached 336 km per hour on the Mulsanne straight. The winning Porsche 919, in 2015 a 8 megajoule car, reached 337 km per hour with hybrid system. And because of its stable front design, the Nissan drivers had a lot of trust in the car and could even drive the first two bends of the Porsche turns with full throttle. So the car without hybrid system didn't lose on the competition on the straights or in fast corners, but in slow and medium speed turns. Although the Nissan concept had a slower corner entry, drivers could accelerate earlier and easier out of corners. Additionally, the car was very easy to drive in the rain and Nissan even said they hoped for snow. Components like suspension and steering were easy to reach, gearbox was easy to change and the tires could last relatively long. Front tires could last for 2-3 to three stints and because of the little loads at the back, the rear tires only needed to be changed 3 times in the entire race. During the race, there were small hiccups like an open door, but also bigger ones like the constantly overstressed and undercooled front brakes, which already had to be changed after 6 hours. And also fourth gear didn't turn out to be as reliable as Nissan had wished for. So in the end, two cars did not finish, but one saw the checkered flag, which was already a huge achievement for this troubled project. The cars were around 20 seconds per lap slower than the competition with hybrid system, which was their predicted pace, and the Nissan that finished was so far behind that it wasn't classified. So unsurprisingly, Le Mans turned out for them to be a big disaster. The team didn't compete in any other races in 2015 and tried to update the car and sort out the hybrid system, because they could see that the base concept had potential. The big issue which caused many other problems was the hybrid system, that didn't work. They were planning for a simpler electric hybrid system which could then also drive the rear wheels, but just before Christmas 2015, the Nissan management pulled the plug and team members read in the press release the project is over. It was the sad end of an ambitious project with a unique car with potential we could only partly see. 
How did you like the Nissan GTR LM Nismo? Let me know in the comments below and tell me which one is your favorite Le Mans story.